Hello and welcome to the Interbase product address at CodeRage9. We are going to be looking today at how Interbase can really help you embed, deploy and relax when it comes to your data and looking at the key features and capabilities that are around the product and also the uh, some of the new stuff that we're working on uh, for the future and we've got some exceptionally exciting stuff that we're looking to bring through to the Interbase servers and uh, we want to share that with you today and also invite you to join the beta program if you're not with us already on that. My name is Stephen Ball, I'm the Associate Product Manager for Interbase and you can contact me through stephen.ball at embarcadero.com or through my Twitter which is Delphi a ball or through my blog delphiaball.co.uk So say today we're going to look at Interbase today we're going to have a quick look through the roadmap and also have an exclusive preview of Project Delta Force uh, or specifically Change Views which is a new technology that we're introducing into the Interbase core engine and um, we, uh, we're super excited about it and uh, want to be able to uh, help you kind of see see what we're doing and uh, invite you to join us as we work our way through bringing this to market. So Interbase really is about providing a database engine to you that you can embed, deploy and relax. And we call Interbase uh, an embedded database because we provide two versions. One is the library version which you can embed into your applications statically. Um, or as a zero install and then there's the full embedded engine that provides an installer that you can embed within your installers and provides scalable um, powerful database engine from one to multiple users and because of this it's highly prized by ISVs and software vendors who provide their databases as part of their product and Interbase's story works across multiple platforms including iOS and Android today on XC3 and um, provides a very secure database engine which is exceptionally important in today's modern age. Interbase provides a database engine on multiple devices and multiple platforms and we look today to provide out to Windows, to Mac, to iOS, to Android and to Linux and we still have support for Solaris um, on uh, some of our older editions of Interbase um, uh, around as well. So th the core engine of Interbase provides a very highly scalable embeddable database engine. I say we call it embeddable because you can literally embed it with your application. If it's a one user, a hundred user um, application, you can embed it in and send it out. Um, because of Interbase's very small footprint and in memory usage, it's ideal for um, for ISVs and OEM partners to ensure that their software provided out has something that's cost appropriate and also device appropriate for small to very large um, server systems. Interbase is exceptionally easy to deploy. Um, through the installation you can just go next, next, next and finish. And because of its ACID compliance, a multi-generational architecture, Interbase provides a very near zero administration um, product and this helps save a huge amount of money in terms of database administrators, staff time that you need to provide to work with and tune up the Interbase engine um, which means overall it has an exceptionally low total cost of ownership. Encryption is also built in and we provide AES and DES strength encryption but the AES strength 256 bit encryption is the base point that you really want to be looking at now that tied in with the user level security, the role based authentication that we can provide gives you very flexible powerful data security that operates all the way through the product life cycle ensuring that you can make sure only the right people see the right data at the right time uh, and it means you don't have to give your data access to your developers you can provide them with an encrypted version that provides default values when you, they're working with um, sensitive data um, for example, if you don't want them to see the HR department data, then don't allow them access to it. Uh, allow them access to see um, whatever base value you want them to see for their development and then let the appropriate user verify that they can see the data in the application at runtime. And This also helps in terms of breach capabilities and ensuring that 
the um, data is inadvertently exposed by a developer who's not quite sure what they should be doing with restricted data. Um, because of this, all the way through the product lifecycle, because the database file is encrypted, it means your data is safe wherever it goes, which is exceptionally important to providing turnkey solution security across the enterprise. Now, InSpace comes in a number of editions. The installed editions are the server and the desktop editions, and then the library editions are the to-go and the IB Lite edition. We offer trial editions across the products as well. Um, we offer the an installed trial, which is a full 90-day trial, and then we also offer an embedded version, which is the to-go edition trial, and um, this provides full encryption and testing capabilities as well. If you're a developer, then we provide a developer edition, which provides 20 users and 80 concurrent connections. And we also have an SDK pack that's been launched this year, which you can acquire through our, our channels. And that provides full testing licenses, which you can use to fully test your deployable, embeddable servers as well, um, which gives you kind of full end-to-end -end testing and can be used for your sales team as well to be able to demo the product that you're looking to sell. So the SDK product is really, really worth having a look at, and it's $99 for the year. You know, it really is as simple as signing up and off you go. Now, the InSpace roadmap is available publicly um, on EDN at Article 43963. And there we talk about some of the exciting stuff that we're looking to do, um, some of it which we're going to clarify in more detail through today's session. But uh, we are looking at both now 32 and 64-bit support for Linux to join the 32 and 64-bit support that we have for Windows servers. And we are also looking at large transaction ID support. This basically means that databases can run for even longer between backup and restores. Um, if you're running thousands of transactions a minute, then after around about a month, uh, you will be looking to back up and restore your database as part of your, your admin processes. With the 64-bit transaction IDs, that's going to be into hundreds of years that you need to worry about worrying, uh, needing to back up and restore your database because you've run out of transaction IDs. So this really does make it run for a lot longer uh, on much higher transaction load workspaces. Um, for most users, then 32-bit you know, transaction IDs will keep you going for an exceptionally long time. Um, but uh, where you do have very high transaction throughput, um, then along with the SMP support, um, you know, 64-bit transaction IDs is great. Now, one of the key technologies that we're looking at um, introducing is a great way for developers to be able to manage tracking of changes to data. And this is part of what we're going to be talking about through change views. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But we also have much faster database dumps coming in. Um, this allows us to... Uh, have a hot backup database ready just to convert it from being read-only to read-write and ready to go. Um, and uh, also you can use that fast database um, backup for load balancing, for running reporting systems and so on. So um, multiple uses for it, but um, a much faster distinguished data dump now. We've already deployed out our embeddable client this year, uh, which allows you to connect into a remote interface server from a Windows, Mac, iOS or Android client. Um, but it also, IB Lite provides client-side data storage as well. Um, and with a free edition, that's exceptionally powerful for um, clients to have. We've also been working on updating our demos into an SVN. And this can be used with the, the new database technologies in Rad Studio to open samples directly from the SVN, but also provides us a much quicker and easier way to provide you with updates to samples uh, in the long term as well. We also have moved our documentation up to DocWiki. So there's now a docwiki.embarcadero.com for Interbase, and that allows you to search through much quicker and easier. We also will be maintaining the PDFs. Um, for the different um, developer guides, um, but this provides um, two ways now to be able to get to the documentation and get to it a lot quicker. Now, two sessions that I would like to draw your attention to from earlier in the year. Certainly, if you're storing any data at rest anywhere, on a server, on a client, if you're storing any data that has customer data, personal data of any shape, way, or form, then it's a must to watch and understand the um, the 
the challenges and the legal responsibilities that we cover through the Rise to the Data Security Challenge website. Uh, you can get the URL just by scanning the QR code on screen or by visiting embt.co forward slash capital I capital B hyphen five hyphen two eight. And that will allow you to register there and get that replay. Also, if you're looking to mobilize data and take data out onto mobile platforms, um, following on from that webinar, there's a, an excellent white paper um, which is mobilizing enterprise data. Um, also applies a lot to data at rest, um, but that's empt.co forward slash capital M, lowercase ob, capital E, lowercase nt, capital W, capital P for mob ent white paper. That will allow you to um, register and download that um, PDF and read through those, um, those really important um, things to avoid as you go through taking data to mobile. Now I also want to briefly mention about EMS because uh, EMS has been launched this year, Enterprise Mobility Services and Enterprise Mobility Services is about providing you full front to back end with client side databases for Interbase to go um, which provide full encryption on devices and also full encryption enabled database server on the back end uh, with Interbase. Um, you don't need to use Interbase on the back end, but if you've got the license for it there, it kind of makes sense to, to use it where you can. And uh, EMS provides um, a great way to build your own custom packages that you can deploy into the EMS server and then have all the rich business analytics that comes along with knowing who's using what, where and when through your uh, middle tier server. And with the direct connections through FIDAC or IBX to your Interbase databases, this is an exceptionally cool fast way to provide out data in a very mobile friendly way and also track an awful lot of um, usage information around it that then can drive the business needs moving forward as well about what you support when you're supporting um, different features um, being up and down for maintenance and so on as well. EMS is, um, provides a developer edition uh, which comes with Rad Studio uh, or app method and there's also then um, custom pricing for different user levels uh, available. Um, if you want to contact your local rep, they'll be able to help you with your own specific requirements. And again, as always, there's ISV OEM pricing uh, available uh, under our VAR model um, for you to, to get involved with. OK, so let's talk a little bit about Delta Force and what's coming up in Delta Force. So Project Delta Force is very much about enabling you to run for faster, for longer, and simplifying the whole concept of getting changes out to remote clients, um, be them servers or um, remote desktops or remote mobiles or remote briefcases of any type. Now, we are talking now about some pre-release software, so the usual um, disclaimer just to say that this is uh, part of the beta and this is some things may be subject to change, um, what we see here is an, ex an exact promise to deliver exactly what we see. So the core features we are expecting to deliver through with Delta Force um, is 64-bit transaction IDs and change views. Change views is massive and I will spend a bit of time. Uh, in fact, we're going to have a, a really good demo um, from our principal engineer, Sharam, who's going to be taking us through change views shortly. But um, I'll, everything we've been doing on Delta Force is about improving the speed. Um, we've got an SMP improvement coming through, index manager changes that are coming in, um, distinguished data dumps which speed up the, um, the creation of uh, read-only copies of the database and um, also then you know, going further about speed, uh, being able to provide 64-bit versions for Linux as well uh, and also exposing um, additional APIs that we have within the product for journaling and online dumps. Now, with um, introducing a 64-bit Linux server, um, we are going to have binary compatible versions between for the database files between Windows and Linux that allows you to develop on one machine and just copy onto the, uh, the target to deploy it out to, uh, which eads the development cycle. We are looking to support Ubuntu 14, Red Hat Enterprise on Linux for 6 and 7, and SUSE 11. And obviously, as always, any of these versions can connect 
uh, any interspace version can connect through to a Linux server. Okay, so let's talk about change views. Um, change views, I'm just going to give you a, a few minutes context on them and then we'll get into um, a really, really cool demo looking at these in action. So what is a change view? Well, a change view is a subscription-based model that allows you to subscribe to data and those through those subscriptions you are then able to identify what has changed since you started your subscription to the data. Subscriptions can run either during a transaction or spanning connections and time. So once you start a database transaction, you can then be working with your subscription, you can disconnect from the database, you can reconnect up with a new transaction at a point in time in the future, you can then activate your subscription and then you can then find out what has changed in the database in the meantime. Now every subscriber to the database can have multiple devices that they subscribe to the database. Each device basically is an endpoint that you want to have um, a managed point in time for your subscriptions. Now a traditional brief casing model, if we take each of these colours as a point in time and some changes happening, you need to download maybe 23 different data packet changes as time goes through. With change views, we're able to identify at a field level specifically what has changed and then allow you to pass only those changes down. Now this is really important when you start thinking, if I've got a salesperson out in the field and they may be updating um, specifically uh, their stock information before they go into a customer's visit, if you've just updated all the stock items with their on-hand data and you may store a photo for that stock on the record, you don't want to be pushing the entire data down. Um, so using change views you can identify just specifically the elements that have changed, leave the other data behind. And that drastically reduces the time it takes to update, the speed it takes to update over cellular data as well, uh, the performance of your applications, and most importantly as well, the cost of updating your local data. Um, so you're able to keep in sync a lot quicker and a lot more cost effectively. And from a developer point, this is so easy to implement. So why are we getting really excited about change views here? Uh, and why would you want to use change views? Well, traditional ways of tracking changes are either with triggers or with dates. So let's start off with triggers. Triggers are very high cost at runtime. They verbose the database out by using a log table that every single subscriber who wants to track different changes to data has to have those logged. And then when you connect up, you can then find out what's changed and work your way through the change log. Now, that's great, um, but um, it's very hard to query what specifically has changed if you just want to do a quick look up on, say, a specific table. Um, and also, um, the more users you have connecting in, each with their own logging going on, um, the more verbose your database gets. So logging via triggers is really suited to small scale deployments only. And with change views, we provide a near zero database speed effect. Um, this is logged specifically um, on the record within the database, and we're able to identify specifically at when time they've been changed. Um, this has very minimal on disk size effect, so we don't have a large log file that's going through. We have field level granularity, so we're able to identify specifically what fields have been changed, where and when. We're able to query through SQL for what fields have changed, what is the change state of the field, um, and get that subset of data of what's changed back as well. And it's very highly scalable. You know, change views has the same cost on a database as a single, you know, from one user to a thousand users. With date fields, Date fields are rather verbose. Um, you have to add extra co um, columns to your database just to be able to track changes. They can increase then obviously disk usage. They become exceptionally complex if you, to manage, especially if you want to um, retrofit them into an application later, 
you need to plan them up front to make sure that your queries are all working up front. And um, also, you know, if you have multiple fields in the database that are just there storing redundant data, that becomes you know, complexity that you need to manage as well. Date fields provide um, issues around simultaneous users updating data. Um, you either have to block users sequentially um, from writing their entire blocker changes. So, you know, when they go and ask for the changes that have happened since a specific point in time, that they get back the things they should be getting, um, which is not particularly good in high volume areas. Um, or you run you know, risks around dates being wrong and missing data. Um, also, it's very hard to identify what you knew about so you don't end up pulling your own data changes back to yourself as well. With change views, you are able to identify specifically what you have put into the database so they're not sent back to you automatically. Um, if you want to connect in and make them changes anonymously, then you will get those changes back if you need to. Um, but why move that data back if you've made the changes? There's no meta changes that you need to make to the specific tables um, by adding fields or columns or triggers to track changes. Um, very, very easy to, to manage either before or after, and you can query them uh, as you go through to find out what has changed at runtime. So hopefully that's kind of whetted your appetite for change views. I'm now going to hand over to our principal lead engineer, um, Shuram, who's going to take us through um, change views. Thanks, Stephen. I'm going to take the time uh, just to quickly demo the change view feature. And I thought, uh, what better than taking our sample database and trying to implement a uh, change view on top of it. My name is uh, Sriram Balasubramanian, and I am the engineering team lead for Interbase. And today, we are going to walk through setting up subscription uh, in a simple use case scenario and seeing how we can uh, fetch changed record information from the database. So here, uh, just quickly put together a story, um, say for a startup CEO who's using the employee, uh, an employee database and uh, the CEO might be interested in uh, looking at uh, or subscribing to uh, changes uh, in certain tables. Um, so uh, they want to make sure that they are looking at key information within the database uh, that's changed uh, without having to implement a lot of uh, any database schema changes. Uh, they are just going to be uh, identifying assets that they want to track and uh, setting up subscriptions on them. So uh, subsequently, uh, when, they are, um, when the CEO is actually going ahead and uh, fetching the information, they just get notified about the changed data uh, rather than being bombarded with uh, the hundreds or thousands of or millions of records that are existing in those tables. So some of the goals uh, for the user, uh, in this case the CEO, uh, is to track changes on uh, customer accounts uh, that's in employee.gdb, it's tracked as a customer table. Um, track changes related to any employee information. Uh, employees are a key asset in the company and any kind of changes that happen for the employee records are important as well. The CEO, since it's a startup company, is also interested in uh, making sure that uh, sales uh, are occurring uh, uh, consistently and orders are getting shipped to customers. And then of course, uh, they may also be interested in uh, checking out any department uh, relocation decisions that have happened uh, since they last checked into the data. So that's, that's just basically a set of stories uh, that I sort of pulled in together. And now we are going to see how we are going to set that up in the employee database. In our demo, uh, we are essentially going to uh, go through and set up the subscriptions using the script. And um, then subsequently, we have a case where the CEO has three different devices that they're using uh, with this common database. Uh, on one device, uh, I mean, we're just naming the three devices as laptop, tablet, and phone. And the idea behind this demo is to show that irrespective of where they're using the application, if they connect back to the same common database on a remote server, they're going to be fetching information on that device that they have uh, that they want to refresh from the last time that they used that device. So 
and that's what they are interested in looking at all the changes on that particular device since they lost refreshed the information. So we have specific uh, helper scripts out there that, that we have put together for this demo. Uh, there are two categories of scripts. One is to check for changes from a particular device or destination as we call them. And another uh, script is just to make changes from that device. So if the changes are being run from one device, you should be able to use the other device and say, okay, what were the changes um, since I last checked on this particular device? So we are going to be going through uh, the steps to make sure that initially you go ahead and set up your subscription, uh, fetch your data for the first time, in which case you will be getting all of the data. And then subsequently, uh, any uh, checks for uh, changes will return you only information uh, that has been changed since you last uh, refreshed on that device. So let's go ahead and um, set up the database. Running the sun, uh, run setup uh, information uh, script, and what this inf uh, script does is it just basically restores your sample employee backup file into a new database, um, just resource the database and then sets up subscription on specific assets. If we look at the setup, what we have done here is we have identified since the CEO is interested in subscribing to different uh, changes in the database, we have identified all the assets that they are interested in subscribing to. So we are using the create subscription command and giving it a name. The, the, the subscription can be any uh, name uh, that you want to define. Of course, it shares the namespace with other entities in the database. But in this case, we are named it as subscription CEO multi-device. And uh, it's setting up a subscription on employee for row insert update delete. So essentially here we are saying we want to be notified of any change to this table, whether it's an insert update or a delete clause. Likewise, for customer records, in the sales table, the CEO is interested in only uh, checking for updates, uh, especially for orders that need uh, that have just been shipped or have been shipped uh, since the last time they checked for data. And then, of course, as we uh, noticed, you can also mention uh, table names with specific columns or set of columns that you're interested in rather than the whole table. Uh, certain, I mean, in this particular use case, we are saying the CEO is interested in location changes on table department. And of course, the descriptions are always helpful to know what kind of subscriptions are available in the uh, database. So if you're a developer or an administrator, you can set up uh, all of the subscriptions and people can then start using those subscriptions. Um, what we do see here is you do have to provide a grant subscribe uh, clause to certain users. In this case, in this use case, we just have a single user in the database, which is this DBA, and you do have to grant subscribe to users that you may want to use the subscription. So if you have more than um, the SysDBA, I mean, which is very typical, uh, databases do contain a lot of database users. So you can subscribe selectively who gets to um, use the subscription in their applications. So now that we have set up this database uh, with a subscription, um, we can go ahead and start using it. The, one of the first things that you would do uh, in your uh, database is uh, from your application when you uh, selectively connect to a subscription or use a subscription, uh, you may want to use, I mean, you will want to, you will have to use the set subscription clause as part of the change view uh, feature. So what you're uh, deciding to do in this particular script is set the subscription active that uh, on that particular device. Um, and this is a subscription that you just created, that was created for you, and you have been granted access. So you come in from a different session and say, I want to use this subscription now, and the device that I am activating this subscription for is my tablet. Uh, you have a similar, um, you have to, identify your application from which device you are coming in. 
uh, of course if you this is optional if you do not give a device or a destination as we call them uh, then the subscription is sort of tracked for that user and you won't be able to distinguish between from one device to the other uh, anytime you execute a, a query uh, you will only get changes from the last time you refresh on any device but if you want to track it per device you can go ahead and give the at clause uh, just as a comparison, uh, in this particular SQL script, we do have the device identified as a tablet. We do have another SQL script where the device is identified as a phone. Uh, you could have a device which is identified as a laptop. So you can track subscriptions on each device uh, uniquely. Uh, but if you did not want to do that, if you just wanted to track it for your user, uh, you just don't provide the at destination clause. So as we have noticed in this uh, uh, SQL script, you do activate the subscription that you want to use. And from this point onwards, any query that you execute on the tables where we have set up subscription, uh, you will get only changes uh, on that have been done to that particular uh, set of records in the table. The first time you ever execute this set subscription command uh, for the subscription that you have been granted, you will get uh, all the records. And the reason for this is uh, the database has to have some initialization of your subscription. Uh, basically, it has to know that from a particular destination or for a particular user, this is where it starts or needs to start tracking changes. So the first time you do execute any of these queries in an active subscription, you are going to get all the records. But subsequently, when you keep running the same uh, query within uh, new activations uh, of the same uh, device or the destination, you will only see changes. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, run our scenario of um, this. So in my case, I, I just go ahead and have uh, three different devices as three different windows. And I'm going to show you, uh, I'm considering that this is my uh, laptop and this is my tablet and this is my phone device just for illustration. So on my laptop, I will go ahead and uh, run check changes from laptop. So what, what does this uh, script do? Uh, what the script does is it will go ahead and run a similar uh, SQL like what you're seeing for the tablet here, but for the laptop. So just like I mentioned previously, uh, you're going to identify your laptop as a device where you would want to initialize your subscription and then go ahead and select all the data. The first time you do this, you're going to get all of the records. Of course, there's just a bunch of records. So you end up getting all of the records um, as we noticed because we are not putting any conditional clause on uh, or selective uh, filtering of any of the data, you're just going ahead and selecting all of the records. Now you can think of a client server uh, over a WAN uh, or a LAN where a ban there might be bandwidth restrictions and you're still going ahead and getting all of these records the first time around. But subsequent uh, runs of this query is going to get you only changes that have happened since, like in this particular case, we ran it for the laptop. If you run the same script another time, we don't get any records back because now your subscription has been set, a flag post has been set the first time you ran it. And subsequently, when you run the same script once again, you're not getting any records because there have been no changes that have been done to the uh, tables that you're interested in or that you're subscribed to. So we'll go ahead and run the same. Um, when I say the same, we are going to check for changes on a tablet and since we are running it for the first time on the tablet we are going to get a similar set of all the records uh, against that database and we will do the same against the phone as well and the first time the application runs with the subscriptions active on the phone it set a flag post for the phone as well 
So subsequent runs is going to show you only changes, just like what we saw on the laptop. Now the next step in this um, process, of course, would be for us to go ahead and uh, implement some changes, actually. So in, as part of a demo, what we have just gone through right now is initializing our subscriptions on each of the device where we are interested in and checking for changes initially. So you have got all the records and there are no changes to report at this point. Over the course of time, someone might actually change some data which you are going to be notified about. So let's go ahead and run the first part of the demo where we implement a change on the laptop. And when we implement the change on the laptop, uh, of course the laptop uh, application or the destination is the one that's run through the change. So it's not going to be notified itself that it's done some changes uh, when it looks up for changed information. But if you run the same queries on tablet and on phone, you're going to be now notified what changes happened on the tables that you're subscribed to. So first we are going to run the changes on the laptop. So the changes on the laptop, what does it do? Um, if we look at the uh, change, uh, this is what the laptop uh, application or the destination uh, application does. In this case, the laptop is going to connect to the database in question and it's going to make some very rudimentary changes. It's going to move an employee. Uh, this particular application moves an employee uh, from one department to another. Uh, so they're being moved to the employee is being moved to department number 671 uh, with the sample data. Then it goes ahead and uh, we also update an employee salary and give them a 5%, the employee gets a 5% raise. Um, and then it goes ahead and commits the uh, data. Now, of course, notice that in this case, the laptop is the one that actually makes the, uh, the laptop application is the one that makes the changes. So subsequently, when the laptop uh, application or destination device uh, selects from these tables, it's not going to be notified that uh, there are any changes that it needs to consume because it was the one that was that made the changes. But if you do run the select query from the tablet or the phone, you are now going to be notified of changes in the employee table, right? Because the employee was moved from one department to another and some other employee got a salary change. You're going to see those changes here. So um, let's go ahead and uh, run the change script on the laptop. And we'll see, based on the output, uh, we will see what this particular SQL uh, does, as we just noticed. Uh, we are basically updating the uh, employee's uh, department to 671, right there. And we are going ahead and um, also updating the employee's salary uh, with a 5% raise. Of course, if we now uh, say the CEO is now using his tablet, uh, to check for changes that have happened in the database since they last checked for changes. The tablet is just going to quickly notify you based on because that's a destination device where you're subscribing and you're setting a subscription to active. And now you get only, even though you execute select uh, on all of the records with an employee, your subscription window is now active. So you're going to only see uh, the changes that have happened in uh, the tables that you're subscribed to. So even though you, you do a select uh, all records from employee, you're just going to be notified of the two records that are actually changed. Now, if you do change your destination, say you do bring up your uh, phone and run the same application, the phone is also going to be notified because it's, it's now moving its uh, uh, subscription flag post from what it did refresh uh, earlier on. And now it's going to be notified of the changes. Now, there's a special clause that I want to uh, mention out here. Since you are activating a subscription and looking for only changes uh, in the tables that you're subscribed to, once you do uh, commit your transaction, your subscription snapshot has now moved forward. So any subsequent runs of the same uh, query is not going to notify you uh, anymore about the changes. Those changes have already been consumed by the application. Now. The relevancy out here, of course, is your application can only work on the change data uh, and you can uh, do something with it. But it, the more important thing out here also is that uh, you can set up your subscription such that bandwidth consumption is to a minimum uh, and you don't have to select all of the records or implement any um, schema changes to track 
uh, changes within the table. All you do is set up your subscriptions and interface will notify you of all change data. So now, um, of course, as, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, if since the laptop is the one that actually made this uh, uh, changes to the records, if you run a check for changes on the laptop, you're not going to be notified of any changes because you're the one who actually made the changes. Now we can just move forward to another device and uh, run other changes that um, say you want to do uh, on your tablet. Now what does the tablet do? It selectively modifies some additional information in the database, right? It goes ahead and um, changes the department location uh, for department number 180. And it moves it, uh, the change was that the department moved to Austin, Texas. Now, of course, the you made this change on the tablet, but the laptop and the phone uh, application have not yet refreshed those changes. So if you run your check changes on the phone, now the phone is going to only get the specific changes that were supposed to be submitted to the phone um, because it was just refreshing your uh, subscriptions. Likewise, if the CEO runs the same application on the laptop, they're now going to see that something else changed in uh, so irrespective of whatever application or destination device they use, they're always going to see the changes since the last time they refreshed the data on that particular destination device. Uh, just for illustration, we'll go ahead and run uh, some changes uh, on the phone as well. And the phone makes modifications to other assets that you're tracking. In this case, you may remember from our story earlier on that we wanted to also track uh, order status. If a particular order uh, did get shipped, then that should be coming up in, in the list of uh, uh, changes that the CEO is interested in. So as you can notice in this particular test script, we are making changes to an underlying table, uh, sales table, and this particular order has been shipped on this date. Now, of course, between the time uh, you could have a number of orders that have been shipped since the last time the application was used on a different device. And when you do look up for changes, it's going to show you a list of all the uh, orders that have been shipped since the time you last refreshed. Now, of course, on the phone, you have made a change and you have shipped an order from here. And if you look for changes on the tablet, you're going to now be notified that the order did indeed uh, ship. Now, you will notice... Uh, in this case, there's a, in iSQL, uh, along with having a set changes clause, which indicates to iSQL that it needs to uh, print some additional information about what the change was. You'll notice that uh, the change was essentially updating uh, the status of that particular PO order to ship, and at the same time, it also notifies you that the change was actually an update. Um, in the ship date column. So it does put in a new date when the order was shipped and it also notifies you what was the change that actually changed in that record. So you can see over time uh, in interfaces uh, versioning or multi-generation architecture is uh, in, the back, in the background, we are keeping track of all the uh, states that implemented a change in that record version. And uh, you only get notified if you subscribe to that particular state uh, change. So you may remember uh, when you set up uh, the subscriptions, uh, you mentioned that you're not only interested in updates on sales table, right? So if someone went ahead and ordered, um, inserted a bunch of data to the sales table, that's not going to show up in your change list because you're not interested in the new orders uh, in the sales table. You're just interested in updates in the sales table. So you can selectively mention what states you're interested in in your subscription, whether it's new records, updates to existing records, or deleted records. Uh, in some cases, you may want to track deletes uh, where you have lost some data inadvertently or uh, you have lost some customer information or anything of the sort on the table. And you can set, selectively put in a subscription for deleted records. So the next time you refresh for deleted records, you will be notified that um, those records are indeed deleted and only those. So here we did make a change uh, to the ship order status and going back to the laptop window, if you do run uh, check changes on the laptop, you're going to be notified of what change happened. And you will notice that the other 
to queries or when you're querying for information from employee and customers, you don't get any results set back because there were no changes in those tables since you last refreshed on the laptop. But there have been changes to the sales uh, records and what the change was. All right. So we did walk through a very simple use case of uh, what uh, change view on subscription uh, setup uh, can uh, help you achieve and how easy it is to go ahead and uh, set up a subscription on top of an existing database. And you can selectively, very selectively, uh, you can um, either uh, subscribe to changes on the whole, uh, on all of the records uh, for uh, any kind of change, or you can selectively go ahead and uh, uh, apply uh, for a subscription for specific columns that have either changed um, as an insert or as an update or as a delete. Uh, you can choose your states and you can choose your columns if you uh, so choose to do that. Or you can just uh, select, uh, go ahead and say, I I'm interested in all kinds of changes on this table. And as long as you're granted uh, to use that subscription, um, it will just help you uh, reduce any kind of bandwidth consumption and also uh, specifically provide you data that you're interested in uh, rather than having to define filters or make any uh, schema changes in your a database. So that is just a, a short and um, a single use case where multiple devices are used by one particular user. And now I'll uh, turn it back to Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Shuram. That was an, an excellent demo of change views and something I'm really looking forward to being able to get out and, and travel and um, talking to you guys about uh, more and more. If you can't wait, please do let us know. Come join the beta and contact me on stephen.ball at embarcadero.com. Uh, please do provide me your EDN account, username and email and uh, also which company you're working for. If you're using Interbase already, that'd be great to know. Uh, and also what specifically is driving you to, to want to try and use the, um, the beta. Um, that would be great to, to hear all those things. So I know we've taken quite a bit of time now through to get through this product address, but time for some questions uh, and, uh, and to kind of um, listen to your feedback really on what we're doing. I want to be able to link to IB Server Plus maintain limited local copy on Android device using mm -hmm. app method with IB Lite for the app and talking to the back end IB Linux server. I presume this is simple? Yeah, and let's say this, we'll, we'll show an example of that in the, in the other session. Um, you basically just connect up as you normally would do to an interface database. Um, apart from on the, the drivers, you just mark it to be using the embedded driver. Um, and that's it. Uh, you can then just tell it where the database is, if it's local or if it's remote. Um, and with the Ivy Lite um, being a, a static library that's built into your application, you then actually have the, the whole database engine running inside your application, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and you know, it allows you to do things um, like a, an in-app purchase if you wanted to implement that, to swap out the license file to be on a, a full copy, which then gives you kind of uh, additional capabilities beyond you know, the basic hybrid light additions. So um, you know, th there's ways to be able to kind of give um, the end user the, the ability to kind of turn on the extra uh, encryption and disk storage and so on, um, and have that kind of managed for you within the application, which is kind of nice. Do you expect to uh, change the licensing for IB to go from per installation to uh, a per developer charge? Um, we've been we've been looking around um, a number of different models that would actually work for the business. Um, we're you know, we're always open to kind of looking at different ideas, um, but the key thing I would say is we have an ISV bar program. Um, it's $99 to sign up to it, um, and that gives you the SDK pack uh, with testing licenses for all platforms. Um, and you know, that's the, that's the best way to get started and, and try to um, uh, use Interbase as, as a bar. Um, and then uh, you can uh, chat to your sales rep, work out something that works, um, works there, uh, and, and then we can help you kind of get your products to market. Um, but you know, the reason we have IB Light is to, to aim really for the kind of $1, $2 um, kind of applications. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the business value um, that Interbase is about providing you is really for the enterprise um, business applications that you're building. Um, so it's, it's not kind of really targeted at that, that, um, that really low price point. Um, for us to do a developer pricing model, it would be, um, you know, it wouldn't be competitive to compare to what some other people would do for that. So. so Jim asks, if I need a database with 1 million news stories a day and provide provide a search functionality on headlines and story bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, where can you do word search or phrase search for over 100 people? Is Interbase a better solution or is NoSQL better? Um, that's a good question. I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve with the, the stuff that you're doing. Um, also, if, if one of the... You know, there, there is the ability with um, InSpace to have um, UDS, which is user-defined functions, um, that you can program to be able to do specific searches through the database. And I know people have done those kind of um, additional functions. Um, the we don't have uh, we don't have all that functionality built into InSpace out of the box, but there's certainly ways to add that stuff in. But certainly, if you're doing a million news stories a day, um, one of the big considerations you're going to have is about being able to get specific updates and changes down to to custom you know, down to the clients if you were trying to cache that data down there, um, and that's something that we would do better than kind of a NoSQL option. So um, it, it really depends what you're trying to achieve with that. And so I do have uh, Shri Rams joining me here in the office here in the studio here to help with questions as well. So if there are any questions that he would he needs to answer, you can post those as well. Brilliant. Uh, does Interbase support mem tables as in SQL? Uh, maybe sure wants to answer that one. Uh, sure. Uh, well, we don't have mem tables, um, but we do have. Uh, I don't know if if uh, what a use case would be uh, in Interbase specifically. Of course, there are mem tables that are supported by FireDAC, uh, so you could use components uh, uh, like FireDAC to have mem tables in in your application. But with Interbase, we do support. Uh, Temporary tables. Temporary tables essentially, uh, we do. Uh, you can have sort of like a mem table cap uh, capability with transient data that does not need to be persisted uh, beyond your session. Yeah, that's good. Good point. A different way of skinning the same cat, really. Uh, he means caching tables within the engine. So to load the table, I guess he's loading the table and keeping the tables in memory. Is the uh, idea? Yes, absolutely. I mean, within the engine, uh, the interface uh, engine is capable of uh, uh, scaling uh, and keeping a lot more data pages on uh, in cache, in the memory cache. So we do load up uh, as much as uh, you do provide uh, interbase in terms of you know how much you just set up your database cache to be in memory, and our caching algorithms are always uh, optimized uh, to reduce I/O and give you the best performance possible. So. It's always uh, use uh, the memory in in database uh, in memory database cache uh, as much as needed uh, to perform best for the queries that you're providing. So yeah, in there I didn't realize that uh, your mem table support was uh, related to database caching, but database has always supported database caching, and with database 64 bit you can cache a lot more database in memory as well. So there's no more the limit of uh, you know having only uh, Two gigabytes of memory in cache. When you, with the sixty-four bit process, you can have a lot more hundreds of gigabytes in cache. About seven hundred fifty million, if seventy-five million pages in memory. So that that should definitely help you with a lot more data in cache. Wow, that's a lot. Great. <laughs> <laughs> David says, "I have a sampled audio seismic streams and stored on Interbase several hundred and several thousand samples per second for twenty-four hours." At several gigabytes per day. An excellent Linux server lets this work fine. So good to hear. Got uh, good caching going on there. Great to hear, David. Yeah, I uh, say so, you know we've got, we've we've got a lot of in in space customers on the line here today for the product address. Um, uh, please do drop us an email over. Let us know what you think of the new stuff that's coming through. Um, but equally, um, you know, one thing we are looking at doing. Um, 
over the next year is getting more stories out about you guys, um, about how you're using the products um, and uh, you know, helping encourage more and more people onto using Interface, um, which just helps the, the future um, development of the product um, with um, more great you know, information about what you guys are doing. So if you do have a great story like that, um, please do drop me an email over. Um, it'd be great to kind of um, pick up and learn more about what you guys are trying to do um, with Interface um, outside of our kind of current um, efforts that we're doing. So that'd be great. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. We got just a couple minutes before we get on to our next session. Thanks, Sri Ram, for coming in here to help with the questions as well. Always appreciate it, and thanks for the demo in the in the keynote. My pleasure. Thank you.